You have to force yourself, fight those demons that are screaming at you to bolt to the surface to breathe. You have to push back against that for the sake of executing that task, which is in line with that next objective. Welcome to Objective Secure. In this episode, we're gonna discuss an aspect of the first warrior mindset principle, that being, I'll always place the mission first. And within that, we discuss fear. In order to do that, we're first gonna talk about the human brain which of course does a lot of different things for us. What it primarily wants to do above all else is keep us alive. The brain wants to keep us alive. The brain prefers predictability. It prefers the comfort zone. The scientific term being homeostasis. That's where our brain really wants us to be, safe. And in order to maintain us within that safe space, there's a series of security alerts that the brain utilizes to keep us alive. One of those alerts is the notification of a perceived danger or a potential threat. We know this alert as fear. There is going to come a time in which in order to make progress, in order to achieve our goal, in order to secure the objective, in order to reach our mission end state, we are going to have to take the risk in the face of fear. An example that I use in this book is one of my experiences down at dive school. Dive school, which is a nickname for the combat diver qualification course, which is widely considered the most physically and mentally challenging school within the United States Army. It's really difficult to argue against that because in order for the human body to survive, it needs oxygen above all else. More than food, water, shelter. You can go a while without food. You can go a decent amount of time without water. You can't go that long without oxygen. And in dive school, you will go without oxygen. The precipice of dive school, the, the most difficult aspect of that course is known as the one man competency test. One man for short. And anybody within special operations community is familiar with one man, whether you've been there or not. It's notorious. There's a method to the madness with why this test is there and what this test does for students and what it does for the safety of the class moving forward prior to getting into the ocean to conduct maritime operations. But it is the top of that mountain. And it is during that test that many of the students wash out of the course. The details of the course will be a conversation for another time. But what we need to know here for this piece is you will go without air, holding your breath, underwater, repeatedly, over and over and over and over again. It is extraordinarily taxing and scary. 
because it has to be. It's supposed to be. The brain, again, wants to keep us alive. It wants us to breathe oxygen. You have to force yourself, fight those demons that are screaming at you to bolt to the surface to breathe. You have to push back against that for the sake of executing that task, which is in line with that next objective. Easier said than done. I was successful at completing this task. And I can say with 100% certainty that the greatest moments in life exist on the backside of fear. That was a milestone for me. It obviously allowed me to continue to progress in the course to become a combat diver. Fear told me to do one thing and I had to decide to do something different. I was willing to take the risk. Now, fear can come for a variety of reasons. Fear of death, fear of embarrassment, fear of failure. And then there's actually a real sneaky type of fear that comes up almost out of nowhere, and that's fear of success. What if I actually make it? Do I have what it takes to run my own company? Do I have what it takes to be a father? Do I have what it takes to play on Sundays? That can be scary. And I also experienced that, which I talk about in the book, and it was during the phase in which I was earning my way back onto the detachment. Ended up being a 12-week phase, a variety of different tests and assessments I had to go through to demonstrate my capability and capacity to return back to an SFODA to then return back to combat operations. I was a few weeks into this. I was knocking things out one after another. Boom, boom, boom. A lot of momentum, a lot of confidence. I felt solid. I woke up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., in a panic because up until that point, it was about me doing what I knew I needed to do, me getting back to the lifestyle in which I had to get back to. And in that one moment, I recognized that I was trying to go back to a team. A team not only with 11 other guys on it, but next to those guys are families. Spouses, kids. When you get into special forces, you are willing to put your life in the hands of someone else as they do with you. And I realized, what if I do make it back? Do I have what it takes to actually operate on a team? Am I going to be a liability? That fear was heavy. <laughs> I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I went into work the next day. I had some really candid conversations with my teammates and leadership. And fortunately, they were able to give me objective, straightforward guidance. We live in a world where that is required. And their response to me was, hey man, we've thought about this, we've talked about this, we don't know what the answer is. But what we do know is we want you to keep going, and if by some chance you're able to make it back onto this team, we'll take a look at it then. I put my trust in those guys to provide me with that objective, honest feedback and when they gave me that response, the surge of energy that I then had was on a whole nother level. Because now, when I'm walking into the gym for my fourth training session of the day, rather than thinking about me getting off the plane back in Afghanistan with my arms raised in the air, 
this glorifying moment for me, I was thinking about my teammate's five-year-old son. And I need to annihilate this training session, not for me, but for that kid. This conversation spills over into, into my work ethic and my productivity. But the point here is this. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to take the risk? There are times in which we want to listen to fear. You're walking down a trail, hiking, you see a grizzly bear. It scares you, as it is supposed to, because your brain wants to keep you alive. Do you continue hiking? Do you continue walking? Or do you listen to that alert and go the other direction? The answer to this question is part of why life is so difficult. And I'm often asked, well, how do I know? How do I know when to ignore fear and take the risk? How do I know? I don't have the exact answer. I don't think anybody does. What I will say is it comes through experience and a certain level of expertise. Obtaining that knowledge and seeing firsthand what happens if and when you listen to that alert and when you ignore that alert. You gather this knowledge, you gather this information so that you're able to decide in the moment if you are willing to risk it or not. The risk of action versus the risk of inaction. We find ourselves in these crossroads constantly. But I stand firm when I say the greatest moments in life exist on the backside of fear. One of the most nerve-wracking experiences I've had was proposing to my now wife. Many of you can relate to that. I don't care how tough, how much of a badass you are. It's scary. It's nerve-wracking. But you suck it up, you take the risk, you do it anyway, and on the backside of that moment is amongst the greatest moments of your life.